Good evening, lovely listeners, and welcome back to Raven Reads. I'm Raven, and tonight we're taking a brief departure from the paranormal because we've fairly listened to a lot of ghost stories and uh, things like that, and I found a few let's not meet stories that I really wanted to narrate. and. They still give me the creeps, and they still give you guys the creeps, and they're also some of my most popular videos, so it seems like you guys really enjoy those as well. Um, don't worry, we will return to our October full of paranormal spooks in no time, uh, but I just found these and I had to read them immediately. <laughs> so that is what we will be doing tonight. Before we get started, I wanted to take a brief moment to let you know what you will be seeing on the screen for the first like quarter of a story. Um, of course, we if you have been around the community tab, you will know that I put up a piece of original art and that prints are available of that piece of art in the shop, which um, we'll link below. The pin pre-orders, of course, are still available, which I have also, it's in the same shop, so they're both linked below. Uh, but a couple of you have inquired about my art channel and what the art channel is and what kind of art I do. And so I will just be sort of putting up a slideshow of the type of art that you can expect from me going forward. Um, and so that is what you'll be seeing on the screen. I'm only going to include that for about a minute or two because I know a lot of you use these videos to fall asleep to. So I'm trying to not make it super bright uh, into the video, but I just thought for those of you who had inquired um, and wanted to know what kind of art I do, I would put that up on the screen. So uh, that is what you'll be looking at. My art channel is always linked in the video description and I believe it's also linked in the end card. So for those of you who are interested in art and the other creative projects that I am doing, uh, then that is there for you. For those of you who are only interested in horror related art, um, like I'm creating some Edgar Allan Poe stuff and some Stephen King fan stuff and you know that sort of thing just stay put stay right here and that's where all that stuff will be so um, there you go <laughs> uh, so sorry again for the long introduction but I just wanted to cover that thank you again to everybody who has pre-ordered a lovely listener pin I'm super excited to get them and uh, yeah I'm just super excited to package them all and ship them out and um, yeah, see what you guys do with them. So links for all that are in the description below. Without further ado, however, uh, grab something to drink, something to eat, to make yourself comfortable, and get ready to take another journey into the night. I was always the weird kid growing up, so making friends was never easy for me. I was a bit of a punk in high school, so living in a preppy religious town was my idea of hell. Eventually, I met this boy, Sean. I was so happy to finally have someone I connected with. We quickly became best friends and hung out nearly every day. He was odd, but so was I, so I just looked past it. Most of the time when we were hanging out, we were also using substances, so I figured some of the stuff he said was just the drugs talking. But one day he said, I'm going to stab someone this week. Four days later, he threatened to shoot up the school on Instagram. He played it off as a joke when I confronted him about it, but when the school confronted him, they took it much more seriously. He was taken into custody by the police, but not charged with anything, somehow. His parents took away his phone and forced him to move away for a few weeks to let the air clear, but we kept in contact. At this point, my dumb self realized that I was in love with him. 
I did everything I could to clear his name. I even got into arguments with parents on Facebook. My parents begged me to stop talking to him, but for some reason, I truly believed he was good. I didn't want to believe he was capable of hurting anyone. The whole shooting thing never really blew over. When he came back to school, students would run from him in the hallways. People were sending him threats. His reputation was ruined. After all of this, something in him changed. He was angrier. We would be talking and joking around about something, and he would start attacking me with words. I'd tell him about a boy I was talking to, and he'd call me a whore. Or, if I made a new friend, he'd go out of his way to ruin that new friendship. And for some reason, I saw this as him being protective. About a year went by after this. The verbal abuse continued, and I continued to do nothing about it. I was still in love with him, but I didn't act on it since he was my closest friend. To keep my mind off Sean, I started dating a boy named Alex. Sean hated Alex. Not for any particular reason, he just didn't like that I spent time with someone who wasn't him. Alex was also a weed dealer, and Sean knew this. Sean asked if Alex would front him some weed since he knew we were best friends, and Alex did. I don't remember the exact amount, but it was decent. Enough to be mad about it if he didn't get paid. Sean never paid Alex. Alex tried to talk to him about it, but Sean always put him off and avoided him. After about a month of this, Alex saw Sean's car in a Taco Bell parking lot and pulled up. He saw Sean in his car and began to get out. Since Alex had anger issues, he also pulled out his baseball bat. Sean saw him and freaked out. He pulled out of the parking lot quickly, drove off, and called 911. He called it a drug deal gone wrong. Alex was then arrested for assault with a deadly weapon. Three days later, when Alex got out of jail, he was driving to his friend's house who lives in Sean's neighborhood when he saw Sean standing in his front yard. Alex rolled down his window and called him a name and then drove away. Sean called the police again, and Alex was arrested for stalking. Around this time, my parents caught me smoking. I didn't want to lie anymore, so I was honest and told my parents everything. Obviously, they were very mad at me for getting into the situation, and I had just told them that I was smoking weed and dating a drug dealer, so I was in a decent amount of trouble. My parents took my phone as soon as I got home from school. I wasn't allowed to see Alex when he got out of jail. They took my paycheck so I didn't have money to buy drugs and they made me download a tracker on my phone so they could make sure that I was home when they weren't. They contemplated calling Sean's parents and telling them what we'd been doing. I knew that if Sean got caught smoking again, he would get kicked out of the house. So I snuck my phone and texted him that my parents might call his parents, and he was pissed. He called me horrible names and said that he wished he had never met me. I finally had enough and told him not to talk to me anymore. My parents never called his parents. We didn't talk at all. I asked not to be scheduled with him at work and avoided him at school. We didn't have any classes together, so it wasn't too hard, but hearing the stuff he'd say about me made it a little difficult. He had started rumors that I was addicted to harder drugs and that I was selling indecent photos of myself. This is when all the text messages started. He began texting me constantly, so I blocked his number. Then he'd use someone else's phone to text me, so I blocked that person's number. But then he would just use WhatsApp or GroupMe to text me, since we used those for work, so I blocked him there. He eventually got fired from our job because he'd been writing tips on receipts if people didn't ask for a copy of their receipt and left the tip line empty. 
The continuous messages went on for weeks, and I just continued to block anyone he was associated with. I didn't want to be in contact with him whatsoever. He kept making new Instagram accounts to message me on, and all of his attempts to contact me failed. One day, I had a late lesson at School of Rock where I took guitar lessons. My teacher had stayed late for me, so I was expecting his car to be the only car in the parking lot, but it wasn't. There were two cars in the parking lot, my teacher's and Sean's. To this day, I don't know how he knew I was going to be there. I quickly parked, locked my doors, and thought about what to do. I then realized that it wasn't his car, so I calmed down a little bit and called inside to ask if he was there, but he wasn't. I cautiously got out of my car, got my guitar, and walked inside with no problems. After my lesson, I came out to see that he was now parked right next to me, waiting for me to get in my car. When he saw me, he began screaming profanities at me. I was paralyzed. He just sat there, screaming at me. I quickly climbed into my car from the passenger door so that I didn't have to walk next to him, and I drove home as fast as I could. He began asking people to ask me to talk to him at school. Of course, I didn't. Each time someone mentioned his name to me, it caused me to have a panic attack so bad that I'd have to leave school. I ended up missing the entire month of November and then switching to online school. A month after I switched to online school, I was driving with a friend to pick up food for my mom. As soon as we pulled into the drive through the car behind me begins to flash their brights at me. I look in my rearview mirror and see Sean's car. He has a sticker across the top of his windshield, so I knew it was him right away. I look over at my friend in fear, and she just said, I didn't want to scare you, so I didn't say anything, but he's been following us since we left Target. I panic and just pretend not to notice him. He then pulled out of the drive through and parked right next to it by the exit. As soon as he pulled out, so did I. I sped to my friend's house, dropped her off, and went straight home. At this point, my parents thought going to the police would be the smartest thing to do. An officer came to my house and took a statement. I showed him screenshots of every message that he'd sent me over the months and my friend that was in the car with me in the drive through talked to him as well. We decided not to press charges, but to just file an incident report. Days go by, and I don't hear anything from him. I thought maybe it was over, and I could move on with my life, but my dad told me that Sean had messaged him on Facebook. He told my dad that I was addicted to pills and that I stole money from him to buy more. I've never done pills in my life. I'm a hippie. I stick to natural stuff. My parents know this, so they screenshot the messages and send them to the police. The police go by his house and tell him to stop contacting me. I continued to get messages from random Instagram accounts, and I sometimes saw his car behind me, but each time I just wrote down the location, the date, and the time that I saw him. At this point, I started to work with Alex's lawyers to prove that Sean wasn't an innocent victim. Eventually, Alex's charges were dropped. Sean was proven to be unreliable since I came forward with my story. I wish I could say that I had an ending to this story, but I don't. I still get random messages, but I don't bother to screenshot them anymore. Since I switched to online school, I was able to graduate a year early, and because of that, I moved away for college, so I don't have to worry about him following me anymore. The last I heard about him was that he got arrested a few months ago. This happened quite a few years ago. I was a 21-year-old female college student studying abroad at a university in the Kansai region of Japan. 
I had lived a fairly sheltered suburban life up until that point, so this experience really stood out to me at the time. I also grew up in a fairly religious household, although my parents were never strict about it and are what I would call socially liberal Catholics, pro-choice, all that. I had friends who had gone to the university previously, and they introduced me to a nice Japanese woman aged around 45 to 50. I'll call her Kotoko, but that's not her real name. It turned out that every year, Kotoko hired an American student from my program to help her with her English. Her husband worked, but she didn't, and they had never had any kids, so she spent her time studying, cooking, and reading. With my friend's introduction, she had a friend who worked for Kotoko the previous year, I agreed to become her next tutor. Kotoko and her husband were really great. I'd go to their house every Wednesday afternoon, and we'd spend two hours on English and, at the end, 30 to 60 minutes on Japanese. Kotoko knew that I was slated to take the Japanese fluency test at the end of my time in Japan and insisted on helping me, even though she was paying me around $50 per week to help her. We grew close during this time, and I went to a wine tasting with her and her husband, and when my mom visited, Kotoko hosted us for dinner. For around seven months, Kotoko and I had a great relationship. It bears noting that she never mentioned religion during this time. One week, we decided we would do a Saturday morning session and then get lunch together. Friday night, I received an email from Kotoko. Although she had my email from the beginning, we had only ever texted, and very rarely, so it was very strange to get an email. Also, the email came at 3.30 in the morning, so I didn't see it until Saturday, about two hours before I was scheduled to arrive at her apartment. The email said, I'm paraphrasing, are we still on for today, or are you still mad at me? Absolutely confused, I responded, of course we are, and I'm not mad. I'll be there in two hours. We never had had a fight or any harsh words. Less than an hour later, I got another email from Kotoko. The email described how she and I had had a huge fight the night before, and that she would forgive me and was relieved that I wasn't still angry. Since we hadn't spoken in almost a week, I was pretty thrown, but I knew Kotoko and figured I would just speak to her about it when I got there. I got to the apartment and Kotoko's husband was there. He was never there on Wednesdays. I found this comforting because I knew him so well. So if Kotoko kept acting strangely, I was sure he would notice and explain. I sat down with Kotoko to begin our lesson. Kotoko's English was pretty good, but this day she had a really hard time producing English. From the beginning, I could see her frustration trying to speak, as if she couldn't pour her passion into the words properly. She quickly switched to Japanese and started a fast and anxious conversation about our fight. No matter what I said, I couldn't convince her that we hadn't fought. In fact, denying it made her even more anxious and she began to tell me that I just didn't remember the fight because I wasn't enlightened and others were convincing me that I didn't remember. The lesson never happened. Kotoko got more and more agitated. She told me that my friends, a few of whom she had met, so she named them by name, were evil and bad and were dragging me down to hell. She told me that I was sinning for drinking and clubbing with my friends each week. She was so intense and certain that I began to develop a real fear of what I didn't know. I kept throwing glances to the study where I had seen her husband, assuming that he would hear her rant and come out to calm her down, but he never did. 
Finally, since we weren't studying, I suggested that we just go to lunch. I wanted to be in a public space. Outside her apartment building, Kotoko grabbed my arm so hard that I thought it would bruise, and she was a very tiny person, so it was shocking. She looked me directly in my eyes and said, your friend is going straight to hell, but I can save her. She named my friend. As you might imagine, lunch was awful. By this point, I had been listening to Kotoko for two hours and the constant ranting was getting to me. She told me how my parents and best friend were lost, but that she could save me. When I just stared at her in horror, she revised it so that she could save me and one other and pressed me to pick the person I loved the most. I could choose between my mom, my dad, my brother or my best friend, so that she could save them from hell and the darkness. She went to the bathroom and I started frantically texting my friend Kevin to come to the local station because I was terrified. When she got out of the bathroom, she looked directly at me and said, I know you're texting Kevin. He can't save you. Only I can. There is no way that she could have possibly seen my phone from where she was standing. Finally, unable to take it anymore, I blurted out that I couldn't choose someone to save, so I didn't deserve to be saved either, and I literally ran out of the restaurant. At this point, she had convinced me that my parents and my best friend had died or were in danger, and I ran to the station, where I called my parents long distance. When my mom answered at three in the morning, her time, I burst into tears. I was so relieved that she wasn't dead. When Kevin arrived, it took him two hours to calm me down and make me realize that I hadn't met a disturbing prophet, but that Kotoko was likely mentally ill. I had never met somebody who was experiencing a mental break and her conviction had pulled me in until I truly couldn't figure out if she knew something about existence and the afterlife that I didn't. The fact that her husband acted perfectly normally and never indicated anything was wrong is, to this day, one of the strangest things about it to me. A few days after this incident, Kotoko emailed me to confirm our Wednesday session. I was petrified and only responded that I didn't think it would be good to continue, but that I wished her well. She sent me many more emails and letters and even sent a few letters to my parents' home in the US. None of the letters mentioned religion or that day, and I never responded again. I think this experience is one of the reasons that I later became an atheist. I just couldn't ever look at the ideas of heaven and hell in the same way again, and they were always tinged with real fear for me. Kotoko, I sincerely hope that you got the help you needed, and that you're doing better now. When I was 10 years old, I lived in a relatively small town in Texas, in a small house with my mom. My mom has always had a very caring heart for those in need. So, when my uncle called her one night and told her that he had ran into a homeless girl at the local park, my mom offered to help her out for a day or so, just to get her back on her feet, that sort of thing. When the girl arrived at my house, she said that her name was Laura. Laura told us that she was 16 at the time. She seemed like a shy girl. When my mother asked what she was doing out on the streets, she told us that she'd been kicked out of her home by her mom because her mom accused her of sleeping with her boyfriend. Laura told us that the allegation was not true she told us that her mother's boyfriend was the one who came on to her. My mom gave Laura a place to sleep in the guest bedroom that night. The next day, after breakfast, Laura asked to use my mom's house phone to call her mom to see if she could get some of her things from her mom's house. Laura's mom never answered the phone, and we felt bad for her. 
As a 10 year old girl, I couldn't imagine what she must have been going through. Later that day, I remember watching TV in the living room and minding my own business, but I could feel someone staring at me. So I turned my head to where I felt the gaze. Laura was sending me a glare so cold that if looks could kill, I would have dropped dead. I was confused and a little startled. I turned my head away from her quickly and went back to watching TV, but I could still feel Laura's cold gaze. I couldn't understand what I had done to her to cause her to look at me with such hate. The next day it happened once more. I was in the kitchen getting a glass of water when I could feel someone looking at me. I turned my head to the side and saw Laura's head peering around the corner at me. Her eyes were dark and laced with hatred, and it frightened me, and again I felt so confused as to why she was looking at me like this. I didn't want to cause any trouble, so I didn't bring up Laura's death glares to my mother at all. Later that night, my uncle had joined us for dinner. He had stopped by to see how everything was going with Laura and if we had had any luck finding her a place to live with one of her family members. After dinner, I was washing my plate in the sink when I heard a loud growling sound coming from the dining room. I turned my head to see Laura shaking and growling like some kind of wild animal. My mom and uncle looked disturbed and worried. Laura threw herself on the floor and began thrashing around and screaming as if she were possessed. I was absolutely terrified. It was a scary thing to witness. I grew up very religious. My mom and uncle began praying out loud for Laura while I ran to my room and closed the door. This went on for two hours, but it felt like an eternity of horror. I could hear Laura screaming like a madwoman and growling like some sort of deranged beast. I don't think any of us knew exactly what was going on. After my mom and uncle had prayed for Laura for what felt like forever, Laura told us that she was free from an evil demon that had taken over her. None of us were sure what had really caused her behavior. None of us were sure what had even happened. I peeked my head out of my room to see Laura smiling happily while she curled up on the couch with a blanket. Her eyes opened and she shot a cold glare at me. I quickly closed my bedroom door in fear. I placed a chair in front of my bedroom door and went to sleep. I woke up the next morning by my mom waking me up. She told me that she was taking me out to eat at my favorite restaurant. When I asked her if Laura was going, she gave me a very serious expression, paused for a moment, and then spoke. Your uncle is going to take Laura back to her mom's house. He slept on the couch last night after what happened. He and I were talking when the two of you had gone to sleep and we pieced together that Laura made the entire performance up last night. She's not stable, and we think she's dangerous. As I heard my mother say those words, I felt relief wash over me. I got dressed and went to the car to go to the restaurant with my mom. When we got into the car, we saw Laura and my uncle getting into his truck. Laura looked angry. Her expression was of a child's when you don't give them what they want. She got into my uncle's car and they drove away. I am now 22, but I have never forgotten about this horrific incident. It was Christmas time. My wife and I were staying at her childhood home, where her mother now lived all alone. Well, not if you include the cats. The house was on a quiet cul-de-sac in the suburbs. 
If you're picturing freshly mowed lawns, American flags, and empty sidewalks, well, you're right. It's a single-story home with an attached garage out front. The garage has two doorways, apart from the electric garage door, of course. One leads to the garden and backyard. This had an old doggy door from their days with dear old Max, rest in peace Max, that they covered with a piece of nailed in wood. That had always made me slightly uncomfortable before, but I figured that it had been that way for years now, so what's the worst that could happen? The second door leads to the kitchen, hollow core. It could stop a mouse, but not much else. Definitely not something that wanted in or someone. We were asleep in my wife's childhood bedroom at the front of the house at 3 a.m. I was in that deep, dark recess of sleep. You know, you're in the diving bell and you're submerged hundreds of meters below the surface in black water, protected from the real world by miles of nothingness. Then I heard it. The scream. What are you doing? It was my mother-in-law's voice echoing down the hallway. To me, lost in a sea of sleep, it sounded like a jet engine roaring past my eardrum. I bolted up. What happened next happened in a matter of seconds. But about that scream. Even though I was dead asleep, I heard enough of it to sense an urgency behind it. This wasn't an, oh, you scared me type of scream. This was different, and I knew it. Not consciously yet, but my lizard brain, that piece we retained from our primitive ancestors, knew that something was very wrong. I watch and read a fair amount of true crime, and the scream awakened that horrible fear. The one that says, this can't really be happening to me, can it? Honestly, in that second of the night, it sounded like someone was about to be murdered. You ever wonder if you're a fight or flight type of individual? I always have, and I came to know something about myself after this night. I am a fighter. I leapt out of bed and growled. Yes, growled in the manliest voice I could muster. I'm going to kill you and some profanities and took off running. I tore open the bedroom door and ran into the hallway. There, at the end, I see my mother-in-law, nightgown on, look of utter shock on her face. Standing still, we make eye contact as I continue toward her. Then she turns her head, looks directly into the kitchen. I hurry past her and around the corner into the kitchen. The hollow core door is obliterated, shards everywhere. I look through the open frame and see that the electric garage door is open. I push ahead. As I run into the garage, I hear it. The sound of someone hopping into a running car, just out of view. And just as I make it onto the driveway, I see a car peeling out from the sidewalk adjacent to the house. But the adrenaline is still pumping. And who am I to say no to adrenaline? So, like an idiot, I run barefoot after the car. I give it a good go, but I'm no Michael Johnson, and even he couldn't catch a speeding car. It soon vanishes down the street, and I'm left all alone. The police showed up within three minutes, which I have to say makes me feel a lot more at ease with my mother-in-law living there. They took our statements. My mother-in-law said that she heard a noise, the hollow cord door being kicked in, and walked into the kitchen where she encountered the fearsome burglar, a small framed woman. The police theorized that she was working as part of a team, that it was her job to squeeze through the doggy door, kick in the hollow core, and open the electric garage door for her accomplice. According to the police, the burglars most likely thought nobody was home. Fortunately, my mother-in-law must have caught her off guard and scared her, in addition to my manly growl, of course. 
but it feels good to know that everyone was safe and to learn that I guess I've got a little fight in me. And for the record, we bought the heaviest damn wooden door you have ever seen to replace the hollow core. I'm a nanny and had been with my current family for about two years when the oldest started preschool a couple of days a week. I'd drop him off around 9 and pick him up at 12.30, bringing his baby brother along. Now, this school was very hoity-toity, and most of the families who sent their children were very wealthy. Everyone entering the building had to wear badges with our names printed out. Every entrance had a security guard and metal detector. They employed about 10 security guards around the building that patrolled the place from open till close. I became very familiar with several of them because I'd pass them at their posts on the way in and out. Most were cops making a few extra hundred dollars on their days off. Well, during the fall of 2017, the older boy moved to a new class on the other side of the school. The entrance was never as populated, so it was just a couple of people going in and out of this door during the day. The security guard was from a private company. He was always extremely polite and friendly. One of the nicer security guards, without a doubt. He was probably in his late 20s. I thought he looked like a young Santa Claus. A round, jolly face with a permanently red nose and cheeks framed by a thick brown beard. Thin framed glasses and curly brown hair that went about to his shoulders. I eventually learned that his name was Nick. No joke, which only solidified my comparison. Months passed and we'd see each other two or three days a week. The boys loved to wave to him and he'd always ask how our day was and we'd respond. In January of 2018, I came down with the flu and missed about two weeks of work. When I returned, I continued our regular schedule of school drop-offs and pickups. I was walking past Nick, waved, and he stopped me and said that he noticed I was gone for two weeks and that he hoped I was feeling better. I smiled and thanked him and said it was the sickest I had ever been, but that I was glad to be back. I found it a bit odd that he noticed and that he knew I was sick. I just assumed my employers had told him when they did the drop-offs and pickups while I was gone. I didn't, I didn't think much of it and continued on, but when I went to leave, he stopped me again and told me that he didn't know I wasn't the boy's mother. I laughed and basically said, people confuse me for their mom because I'm with them all the time and we kind of look similar. He laughed too and then said, I was wondering, I never saw you with a husband and you don't have a ring on your fingers, so I just thought you were a single mom. I laughed nervously and didn't really know what to say, so I said, uh, nope, just the nanny. I wanted to kick myself once I got back in the car. I was caught off guard and I'm generally a little bit awkward, so I tend not to respond the best when put on the spot. I guess I didn't realize that he had paid that much attention to me. I was a bit uneasy, but found it harmless. The next drop-off day, I said hello, and he responded by calling me by my name, which he'd never done before, and telling me that I looked nice, which he had definitely never done before. I was very surprised. I started to think that he may be interested in me since learning that I'm not actually a single mom. This was weird for me because I'm gay, so men very seldom take an interest in me since apparently I look gay. When I left, we exchanged a simple goodbye and the rest of the week was pretty non-eventful. In early February, I was doing the drop-off yet again when, on the way out with the baby strapped to my chest, Nick stopped me. He was very courteous, but he asked me if I would be interested in going to dinner with him some weekend. 
Again, I'm incredibly awkward, so my response was to laugh, and I could see that he was immediately offended. I apologized and tried to explain that I was actually engaged and had been in a long-term relationship. This was true. His face changed, and he said, Yeah, well then where's your ring? The way he said it made me uncomfortable. I felt accused and defensive. I told him I don't really like wearing jewelry to work, so I only wear it on the weekends. I had accidentally scratched the baby with the ring when he was just a newborn and basically decided that it wasn't something I would wear when caring for them. He didn't seem satisfied with my answer but let me go and told me to have a good evening. When I came to pick up the older boy that afternoon, Nick seemed agitated. I said hello and no answer. Okay. I was a little upset, but I let it go. I didn't want to hurt this guy's feelings, but geez, could he not tell that I was gay? The constant button-ups didn't clue him in. I mean, did I need an undercut? It wasn't personal. Why was he so angry? When I left again, he ignored me. I just kind of swallowed and thought, oh well, he'll get over it. I had put the baby in his seat in the back of my car and was buckling up the three-year-old when a voice behind me boomed, you didn't have to lie to me. I whipped around and Nick was about a foot away from me. I was grabbed between the car, the open door, and his body. He no longer looked like this jolly, polite young man. He was big, probably about 6'2 and easily 400 pounds. I was scared and I was angry. How dare he come up to me and scare me? And how dare he corner me and intimidate me when he knows I'm doing my job and I have children. I hurried out of the doorway and shut the door and locked it with the keys in my hand. I stood inches away and tried to back up. He continued, you didn't need to lie to me. If you aren't interested in me, just tell me. I don't like liars. I didn't owe this guy anything, but I explained that I wasn't lying. I said that I'm engaged and it's nothing personal. He was a nice, friendly guy and I didn't mean to hurt his feelings. He was angry. He huffed and said, oh, you didn't hurt my feelings. I just don't appreciate dishonesty. You lied about being their mother, so I figured you're lying about this too. I was mad. I never once lied about being their mother. He assumed that I was their mother because I was the one doing drop-offs and pickups. Our conversation never got beyond hello, good day, and goodbye until recently. I decided this conversation was over. He was talking down to me and accusing me of nonsense. I told him that I never lied about this or anything else and that I didn't appreciate his tone. I went around and got in the car and he followed but kept his distance and said, I'm not even sure why I wasted my time on you anyway. I was shocked. He was a completely different person. I avoid altercations at all cost, so for someone to speak to me like this was very upsetting. I ended up disclosing the situation to my employers who got even more upset. They did not like how he spoke to me, and they especially didn't like that this was done around their children. They ended up contacting the school, which I was mortified about. I was terrified to see him again, knowing that he would know that I had told. But that never happened. He was fired and replaced with a retired cop who was incredibly unfriendly, and I was never more grateful. I felt bad. I thought my employers had overreacted, but they were prone to overreactions and honestly I was selfishly happy that I wouldn't have to see him again. I was worried about how awkward it might be. I let it go and weeks passed and school drop-offs were blessedly uneventful. However, in May of 2018, that all changed. I lived in an enclosed apartment complex in uptown Dallas. Our apartment neighbors, a ton of bars, so we have some issues with break-ins and vandalism. We've always had police presence, but after an incident where some drunk guy broke into the office through a window, 
the office manager decided to hire security guards. And guess who ended up doing night shifts? Nick. When I first saw him, I was checking my mail and he passed me in his uniform. I froze and he looked me in the eye and said, good evening, ma'am. Good, I thought he must have forgotten me. I was shaking as I went up to my apartment and immediately told my fiance who I saw. She was aware of the situation with Nick at the old preschool and being the daughter of a cop was always more suspicious and suspected the absolute worst out of everyone. She, she did not want him to find out which apartment was ours so we started taking the back elevator and parking in a different area. He only patrolled the office area, the perimeter of the building, so we found it easy to avoid him for a week or so. One day, the back elevator was out of order, so I had to take the front elevator from the parking garage up to my apartment on the fourth floor. The elevator stopped in the lobby, and Nick walks on in, and I freeze. I guess he could sense that I was anxious. He looked at me and said, Oh, don't worry. I'm not mad you got me fired. Just don't do it again. I didn't even respond. I got off on the fourth floor and then thought, shoot, now he knows which floor I live on. I immediately ran inside and told my fiance and she said that we should contact the management. I convinced her that this was a bad idea, that it could make him angry and that I doubt he'd be let go since he hadn't really done anything. But then I started thinking, did he follow me here? He knew me. How did he end up here? It seemed like too much of a coincidence. I will say that we lived in panic. We kept our door bolted and installed a camera. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of the story of Jennifer Mori. She was a young lawyer living alone in an apartment similar to mine in Houston. She was stalked and attacked by her apartment security guard. He had access to her apartment. She survived, but went through a horrible ordeal, and we were both terrified that the same thing could happen to us. Every noise terrified us. We would get up to make sure the door was bolted several times before we could go to bed. That summer, we were convinced that he would try to do something. Maybe it was just our overactive, worried minds. We ended up avoiding him for the most part. We saw him occasionally, but he didn't seem interested, and although we were always weary, we figured he'd gotten over it, and we let our guards down. And he never did bother me again. He never said much of anything to me when I did see him. I decided that maybe he was just having a really hard time last fall, and maybe he was a really nice guy who didn't have social skills. Fall of 2018 rolls around and I'm busy with work and my fiance is out of town on business meetings. One week, I'm home alone and it's 3.30 in the afternoon and I'm walking down to the office to get a package. There are about three squad cars and police all over the lobby and going up the stairs. I'm wondering what happened, but like I said, we live next to bars and we've had incidents with drunk jerks, so... I figured that someone had an altercation or something got stolen. I tried to eavesdrop, but I didn't hear much. So I go about my day and then I receive an email from my apartment complex saying they have a community-wide meeting scheduled to discuss the incident and to go over resident safety concerns. I'm wondering what the hell happened, so of course I go to the meeting and guess what? A young single girl living in an apartment by herself showed up mid-afternoon to find Nick inside her apartment. She came in and her drawers were in disarray. He was hiding in her closet and came up with some BS excuse. The security guards do not have keys to any apartment and aren't supposed to be in the resident halls. Later, we found out that he'd been stalking this girl and stole the keys from maintenance and made copies. This had been going on for at least a month, if not longer. They found several of her belongings in his vehicle and was obviously going to fire and charge him. 
I didn't follow exactly what happened to him, but we assumed he did some time. It was absolutely terrifying, and of course, our apartment complex got the pants suit out of them. I was glad his attention shifted, but wonder what could have happened to this girl. But unfortunately, this wasn't the last time I saw or heard of him. A few weeks ago, over a year since I last saw him, I went into this big fancy mall in my city and guess who was working security? Yep, jolly old Nick. My first thought was, you have got to be kidding me. My second thought was, how on earth does this guy keep getting security jobs and who's dropping the ball here? I saw him and turned around and walked right out the door. Thankfully, I'm moving out of state next month. So this last story is actually my mom's story and I'm going to keep the details kind of vague because, you know, she's my mom and um, she did say it was fine if I told you guys the story, but you know, we're kind of all very private people. So yeah, <laughs> I'll try to keep the details as vague as possible, but um, I had to tell you guys this story. So, my family is from Washington State, and so, of course, my parents went to college in Western Washington, and there was, at one point during my mom's, you know, college education, where she was asked out on a date, and um, she accepted. And she said that this guy was really charming, and he was really sweet, and um, he seemed, you know, really nice. I should probably give you some context that my mom is a very conservative person, um, like very conservative. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, and it was even more so back then. So she's like straight laced and, you know, no shenanigans like type of person. So, um, you know, this guy must have been impressive is all I'm saying, um, for her to accept a date from him. So she accepts the date and she goes on the date. Everything's really nice. And um, she said he was, you know, it was a great date. He was respectful, polite, everything. So I think she said this was when she was living on campus. So he walked her back to her dorm and uh, he asked her out on another date, but he told her that he had a girlfriend and that they had like an open relationship. <laughs> and I'm laughing because if you knew my mom, you would laugh too. And um, no shade if you're in an open relationship. It's just you know, like nothing my mom would ever partake of, you know. So uh, um, so she was like, uh, you know, thanks, but no thanks. You know, uh, had a nice time, but probably not going to be seeing you again. And he kind of tried to convince her. And um, she was like, no, that that's okay, you know, but thanks. So she goes on with her life and doesn't think too much about this date uh, until one day when she is uh, watching the news and she sees this guy's face on the news and she's like, oh, he looks really familiar. And then she realizes that it's this guy that she had gone on this date with and had declined a second date with. And um, if you're putting the pieces together, you probably already know what I'm about to tell you. But uh, my mom, long story short, um, shirt, <laughs> long story short, uh, went on a single date with Ted Bundy and is probably only alive today because she was very conservative <laughs> and didn't accept a second date with him and his girlfriend. And who knows? I don't even know if he had a girlfriend at the time or if that was just like a story, but... Uh, yeah, very weird. And all this came about because it was actually weird because the the whole Ted Bundy thing on Netflix came about and I'm kind of disgusted with the way that we as a society like glamorize serial killers. Like, I, 
I don't understand the whole, like, like if you're talking about somebody in past tense, right? Like my mom was talking about him in past tense saying like at the time she thought he was charming or whatever. Um, but like, of course, once you learn what that person has done, I don't understand being so enamored with them anymore. And we were talking about this phenomenon. Um, three or four people in my family, including myself, know people who ended up killing people. So, <laughs> Yeah, um, it's been a weird life, guys. <laughs> uh, that's a story for another day, but it's like still too soon. But um, it's been like several years, but it's still, yeah, I'll tell you guys that story someday. But um, anyway, and so I, I was looking through um, sort of like the beginning of that uh, series on Netflix. And I kind of, I didn't know anything about this. And I, you know, this experience that my mom had. And I kind of jokingly told her, I was like, I was like, you know, what's I was like, you know, it's weird, mom. Like you went to college around that time, right? And she was like, uh-huh. <laughs> and I was like, and you were in college in Western Washington. And she was like, uh-huh. <laughs> and I was like, you know, what's so weird. I was like, these victims, like a lot of them look like you did back then, you know, like like you're kind of his mo like you're like not his mo but like victimology you know i was like man you're his type and i was like totally joking around because my mom knows i have a super dark sense of humor and um she got this really <laughs> like weird look on her face and like i can imagine now like knowing what i know now like she must have been like you don't say <laughs> um but yeah, she kind of got quiet and then she was like, well, <laughs> she's like, it's funny you should say that because, uh, <laughs> and then she proceeded to tell me that story. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a weird life, <laughs> but, um, anyway, I just thought you guys would, uh, would like that story. It's, I think it's, might be a longer story than that, but I just thought I would summarize it and throw it in here because I'm, you know, she is fine with me like telling that story, but I'm sure that she wouldn't want me to like make a video with a title that was like, my mom dated Ted Bundy. Although that would be like excellent for YouTube, you know what I mean? But, um, <laughs> but no, I'm, I'm not going to use my, my mom's past trauma for like that much of clickbait. It's not really clickbait, I guess, if it's true, but still not my style, but, um, um, but yeah, so that's, uh, that's our little story <laughs> for tonight. <laughs> um, so I thought we would, uh, sort of switch over to let's not meet stories just for tonight. Um, most of, I don't know how you guys feel about let's not meet. It's weird to me because let's not meet videos are my top videos, like across the board, it, you know? Um, and then second to that are like ghosts, haunted houses, middle of nowhere, and, uh, like shadow people, like that kind of stuff. Um, I'm more into paranormal stuff. I think sometimes the real stuff is like too, too real, right? <laughs> like I listen to scary stories about the paranormal sort of as escapism. I mean, I believe in the paranormal too, so I, I guess it's weird, but you, I think most of you get what I'm saying. Um, but I feel like the thread of like the let's not meet thread has really gone downhill lately. Um, I don't know there and I and then I can't find the stories that I want to narrate like I've read stories in the past before I had a channel that I was like man like that's like a campfire story <laughs> um but I can't find them anymore like uh yeah there was one story about this guy who uh was driving might have been a girl I don't know but they whoever it was they were driving and late at night and they were in the middle of nowhere and they drove through this like desolate field area and there was what looked to be a car accident but there were like tons of people um involved and they were all like sprawled out on the road and he was gonna stop to try to help but then he was like there's no way i can help all these people so i'll just get to where i'm going and then i'll call you know like 911 or something and um so 
he gets further down the road or farther down the road and he looks in his rear view mirror and every single person that was on the ground is standing up in the middle of the road staring at him and there are other people coming out of the woods and i was just like <laughs> like every time i hear that story it just literally sends shivers up and down my spine like that's the kind of story that i want to tell or narrate you know um but it just seems like most of the let's not meet thread nowadays is just like, oh my gosh, I was at this bar and then this guy was like weird and then like he was a drunk and he called me a weird thing. And I'm like, yeah, welcome to like every day being a woman. Like, you know what I'm saying? So I mean, I'm not trying to like uh, put down people's experiences. Like I'm sure like those things can obviously be very upsetting. Uh, but I think most of us who are into like horror and scary stories, whether they're paranormal or not, have experienced some stuff. <laughs> so that kind of story is like, how cute. <laughs> um, you know, again, I'm not trying to be insensitive, but honestly, if that offends you, this isn't your channel. Okay. Um, like it's not the channel for you. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I don't know. I'm just rambling now, but I kind of like these outros that are just a little bit chatty because most of you tell me that you use these stories to fall asleep, so you probably won't be listening to this anyway. <laughs> um, but no, um, yeah, I don't know how I feel about the Let's Not Meet subreddit though. Um, but if you guys have like Let's Not Meet stories, like send them to me and I will definitely, if you want to, and uh, I will definitely, um, you know, read them on the channel. And I still need to do a bunch of my Let's Not Meet stories because I have some actual, like, real scary ones. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure at this point that I just have, like, stalkers apply within, like, somewhere on my face and I'm just not aware of it, but, um, yeah. But that is the only, uh, the, or that is, those are the only stories I have for tonight. And so I hope you guys enjoyed those. Let me know what you think about Let's Not Meet. I think it's weird that they're my top videos because it seems like in the comments, most people are like, meh, I'm over these, you know? Um, I do like some of the themed stories, like, um, you know, uh, night shift stories or EMT stories, but I still tend to prefer ones that border on the paranormal or just are paranormal. Um, same goes with like camping stories and middle of nowhere stories and, um, stuff like that, you know, but, um, I don't know. I thought these were decent stories. And so I thought I would read them and just sort of give us all a palate cleanser, I guess, <laughs> from the amount of ghost stories. Um, I kind of worry sometimes that if I post like, I don't know, four or five ghost stories in a row or something like that, people will be like bored, but probably not. I'm probably just overthinking it as usual. <laughs> so anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the, uh, the videos, videos, the stories. <laughs> It's too late. I need to go to bed. It's like one o'clock in the morning. Um, <laughs> and uh, I hope you enjoy these chatty outros because they're probably going to keep happening. And the good news for you is that if you don't like them, they're at the end. So you can feel very free to just not listen to them. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'm not trying to be rude, but it, that's just the facts. So um, yeah. Thanks for being here. Thanks for listening. Uh, for those of you who are still here, like you're a true hero. Thank you. And um, for those of you who didn't catch it somewhere else or who are interested, like I said in the beginning, I will put all of the links to the shop stuff and the pins and the art and all the things down below. Um, and thank you so much for all of you who have supported the channel in any single way, whether it's by watching the videos or commenting or sharing or, or, um, you know, pre-ordering a pen or being patrons, uh, you know, whatever it is, you guys all help out a lot. And I'm very glad that you guys are all here. So 
that's it for this one. Stay spooky and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye for now. Ooh.